The voice of Husker Nation is on the air. This is Hale Varsity Radio. Insight, opinion, expertise, along with the biggest names talking Nebraska sports. Join in with the show at 402-489-1240 or 1-800-825-5865. Now, here are your hosts, Chris Schmidt and Elijah Herbel. Great to have you in on a Tuesday. It's Hale Bar City. We're powered by Cornhead Lager. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbel back from Donkey Land, or we'll say Nugget Land. Goddard Clark, great to be with you as well on Hale Bar City Radio Tuesday, 489-1240, number to get in, or 800-825-5865 across the Hale Bar City Radio Network. Always watch the show, stream us. And subscribe, like that page, the Hale Varsity YouTube channel. Give us a follow, too, on the Hale Varsity Radio Twitter feed at HVarsity Radio at Schmidt underscore radio. That's my Twitter handle, Chris Schmidt. Uh, Elijah Herbal's at Herbal Essence. Back from vacation is how he's deeming it. Connor Clark has had some underscores added to his Twitter because I'm, I'm being made fun of <laughs> a little bit. Uh, well, we got to get you. I'm catching, got... I'm catching strays that don't need to be caught. There's only two. I was, uh, I was, it's only bummed. one more than Schmitty's. I was a little bit b- bummed because this was my game. I was playing with myself before the show. I am sleep deprived. And I thought this was C underscore. <laughs> yeah, I got it. Um, C underscore Clark underscore 27. There you go. So, so. I was slowly adding. You're, you're how many monsters deep with the overnight drive-in from the game winner? Good, vi- good footage, by the way. Thank from, you. From from Denver. I had a great angle from my. I seat. was going to say from Nichols Arena, but that would uh, put me in Michael Adams territory. What the hell is it called? Ball Arena. Ball Arena. The used, former Pepsi Center. Used to be Pepsi Center. You're there. You're capturing the video. You uh, you shelled out a kidney for. Uh, it wasn't the, that much. Those seats, and the place erupts. In that moment, I mean, what was the roar like? Oh, it was wild. In the arena. Well, I, I'm, I'm taking the video on my phone, and I, it was one of those moments where LeBron misses the three, and if you guys didn't stay up late, the Nuggets were down by 20 points in the second half. They come back to win. It's a tie game late. Uh, LeBron, on the Lakers' final possession, misses a three. He did some whining last night. He always does. Um, but I, for some reason, something in me told me, get out the phone, the Nuggets are going to walk this thing off. They're going to hit the buzzer beater. They're going to win it. Pull out the phone, grab the video. Um, I actually, the guy behind me, uh, I feel really bad about this actually. In my celebration, he was also filming the game-winning shot. And in my celebration, I knocked his phone out of his hands and it shatters. Oh. Dude didn't even care. He was too happy to celebrate. He's giving me hugs. He's laughing about his phone. <laughs> I was hugging random dudes in the crowd. It was like one of those top five sports moments of my entire life that it's just like I've waited for years now to go see a Nuggets playoff game. The timing was right this time around, and for it to be that game that I saw last night where you're down by 20 and you think this is going to be the worst overnight drive home of all time to the comeback of the year, the three-pointer to win it, or sorry, the the two-point step back to win it over Anthony Davis – uh, it made the drive home quite easy last night. I was riding the high off of that victory, not from the other things you can find in Colorado. Yeah. Riding the high off that victory for the a good four hours of that roadie overnight last night, which got me to about Carney. So then I, uh, I rolled the rest of the way with a Celsius, 200 milligrams of caffeine, snuck in a little bit of, of a nap go. before the show. Uh, I ripped a monster here before the show about... 30 minutes ago, and I think I'm ready to roll. I'm feeling good. But anyway, long story short, with the sleep deprivation from pulling the all-night roadie to make it back here for this show, uh, I was keeping myself entertained before the show by slowly <laughs> adding more and more underscores to Connor Clark's Twitter handle on this live stream oh, well, until he noticed. The, the stream wasn't up on the computer in here, and then when I finally clicked over to it, I realized there's something wrong. Lots wrong. With, with, my, uh, with my Twitter It's about handle. seven underscores wrong. <laughs> I just wonder, uh, after Saturday's spring game, are we going to be able to know for certain... With public opinion and what our eyes tell us Saturday at the quarterback spot, will we have that answer with QB underscore one? Uh-huh. Will, we, will, will we know uh, without a doubt based on uh, the the performance in front of the people, the the third largest city in Nebraska, once uh, you fill up Memorial Stadium? I don't know if it's going to be uh, capacity, but going to be great weather. I think there'll be a ton of folks there, but we haven't seen any documentation that spring games sold out have we no 
I don't think so, but I got really excited driving here today because I drove past where they usually do the Rock the Dock, and they're setting it up right mm-hmm. now. I wasn't expecting that for the spring game, but... but well, and, and you just swung by the single barrel, which we'll be waving at you well, exactly. from Saturday morning for the weekend Yes, that's, that's true. <laughs> where you can come find us. Uh, at, you you at, can at, wave at me at, through Schmitty's computer screen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Connor will, will be stuck in the studio for the, for, the, for the weekend edition, 8 to 10 a.m. Saturday. I feel it's like ha- i got to do it one more time before Road show, baseball starts. Road show, 4 to 6, Thursday. Yeah, I was gonna say, it's, it's, how, it's how we're sending Connor out from his college yeah. hey, last Dude, we love game. you. <laughs> Have fun finding <laughs> parking before kickoff. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> No, I got a system down for the fall, so I'll huh? I'll be I'll be all right. You'll be good. You'll, I know I know a guy. You'll sprint there, but uh, good to have you in. We'll get the uh, starting five shout outs in the stream shortly. Big night for baseball, and uh, Nebraska trying to end the Tuesday woes. Mitch Sherman from the Athletic with with us in fifteen minutes. Kenny Bell, great Husker, and NFL are going to join us at five oh five. Of course, he and Nate Gary and Amir Abdullah going to be at the Herdat Sports Bar and Grill. For the Team Jack event and panel, get there. Get your reservations when you log on herdatsports.com uh, and uh, herdatsportsbarandgrill.com. Uh, get uh, get your reservations. All proceeds with uh, food and drink go to help the, the great folks at Team Jack. Kenny Bell there, Nate Gary, Amir Abdullah, Friday at 530. Get there and uh, kick off uh, your spring football weekend the right way. We'll talk to Kenny at 5.05, Michael Brunts with Husker 24-7. Uh, Going to join us uh, to talk some baseball and spring football. Dave Minerick with us from Cornhusker State Games and the Nebraska Sports Council. We'll catch him in the stream at 5.40. In 40 years of Cornhusker State Games goodness, uh, they've got some awesome torch bearers this year, which is going to be incredible. Dave will tell you about. And a wiffle ball has been added to the repertoire. Oh, wait, hold on. Yes, we need a team stat immediately. Okay, I grew up playing wiffle ball. <laughs> I got a nasty slider. Wiffle ball? That would that would be so much we'll, fun. We'll talk to Dave about about yes. uh, doing that for sure. It'd be great. Uh, the fiddler is off to Spartan Land. We had some thoughts on that yesterday. It's official today. And uh, Brian checks in, <laughs> hugging random dudes is info that should stay in Denver. <laughs> that from Brian. Uh, Brian has checked in the stream. Jeff is in first. KG second, as uh, both of them are in Black Hills. Brennan, roll nuggets is what he says. Uh, Brandon is here. Uh, Jay says, hello. Roger Moore, uh, say what's up to Roger. Patrick is here. Mr. Snitley. Not in the top five, but number one in our hearts. Part of that Boulder Peace Treaty as he's uh, hoping that Nebraska can beat the Jayhawks. NASCAR Eric is here. The other Elijahs checked in. Walter from Philly. Justin is in. Anonymous says what's up. Uh, He's asking about Fiddler. How will Fiddler do at at Michigan State? Could be buried on the bench or he could average double figures. Either way, I'd rather have him at NU or else, still in Omaha, Izzo's act has gotten old. Anonymous, I like Izzo. He's the last uh, the last man standing of throwback coaches. Eat Beef is here. DJ says, what's up? So Elijah is back from Denver. Best part of your trip before we talk spring football and some thoughts on Satterfield and, and his commentary. We'll get to, to more of that in hour one. You had $3 beers at Coors. Yep. You saw Wiz Khalifa. Actually, and, I didn't see Wiz Khalifa. What? I, what? I, we went to the show. Oh. Wiz Khalifa was last. <laughs> Hold on a minute. <laughs> oh no! It, cool. First you off, you didn't make it to the end. First off, let's let's lay things out. It, here. it did snow. We talked about in the Saturday morning edition. Five inches it dumped on like the the front range and kind of where we were staying up in the mountains. Red Rocks was included in that. It continued to be cold and dreary and snowy on Saturday night. So being like the one person there that was not partaking in Colorado's national plant um, or state I would plant. Say, I would say national pastime. National pa- whatever you yeah. want to call it. I'm trying to stay warm. I'm drinking double whiskeys and coffee, which they're selling in there. And <laughs> and you're telling me you were cold? Uh, I was very cold. It was brutally. I wasn't prepared. I wasn't prepared for what That's that true. weather was going to be. I didn't bring my long johns or anything. So I saw Flatbush Zombies, Earth Gang, and then we're waiting for Wiz Khalifa. 
and we're all looking around like, do we even care that much about Wiz? It's cold. It's hellish. Let's let's just go back to the Airbnb and drink some beers. So we went back to the Airbnb and drank some beers. So we missed Wiz Khalifa. We saw the show. It's not like we skipped the show. Just after a certain number of double pour whiskey coffees, you... You, 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 uh, you can't take it anymore. Yeah, you can't take it anymore in that cold. Is that your first Red Rock show? It was my first Red Rock show. I hope to be back with a concert that maybe is a little more musical and a little less... Party? Hazy. Yeah. Um, but then Rock, sure. Rockies game, Rockies lost. Who cares? Three dollar, three dollar beers. <laughs> three dollar beers was awesome. I was really proud of my uh, re- reply to your tweet. By the way, you and seventeen of your closest friends. <laughs> it was empty in there. The Avs <laughs> were playing at the same time, and it was game two of a split oh, double header, okay. so no one stuck around, which made the beer line quite short. And then the the highlight of the trip was obviously the Nuggets game last night. So it was it all all in all a good trip. Um, happy to be back though. Happy to get some spring football thoughts and looking forward to the spring game on Saturday. Right back to work. Yeah, it's uh, good to have you back. Enjoy the uh, the trip. I love it. Brian in the stream asks, "Are there any <laughs> random dudes to hug to stay warm?" <laughs> Those aren't pillows. Hey, the the thrill of victory is what led to me hugging men, not the need to stay warm. It's a, a Elijah Her- Elijah Herbal out of context. What's, <laughs> well, what's 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 the craziest it's happened? Was last night the craziest fan interaction you've had? I about punched my grandmother in the face accidentally after the flea kicker game down in Missouri. We're in my folks' basement watching. Everyone's jumping up and down. Next thing I know, Granny's glasses are on the floor because we're jumping up and down. And Grandma got whacked. I think it's, it's up there. Like the, the craziest fan interactions. One happened in a bar in Norfolk. It's whenever Kansas beat Texas in overtime a couple okay. of years ago in oh, football. Yeah. That was another hugging random people at the bar type moment. Um, but Literally just praying on another team's downfall, too. Yeah, that. it was just because just <laughs> Texas lost. It wasn't because Kansas won. It was because, man, Texas lost? Awesome. Texas mm-hmm. lost to two in Kansas. <laughs> but in terms of like... Before that third win. In terms of the moment last night, a little bit of blood in the water for LeBron, Nuggets being down by 20, completing the comeback. It was one of those those sports moments that I don't think I'll ever forget. It's 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 up there. It's, it's probably top three, and I don't think it's three, and it might not be two. It might be number one. To edit this for the stream, Eat Beef says you should have cuddled up to a next to a big person. <laughs> a big person. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's saying the the John Candy side. It's, it's like we had a bunch of claws burns spawn in the stream today. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we'll talk to Claws Friday. <laughs> yeah. uh, so Adam Rittenberg dives in and asks the question here: What must Nebraska do to finally turn the quarter? in an expanding Big Ten, and you have Nebraska mentioned in this article with some teams. Uh, spring football is here, right? What what are the questions for the Texases and Alabamas and USC's and Florida State's? Teams that are trying to contend for the title, and then you've got two uh, sleeping powers that are, are trying to, to wake back up, and it really kind of comes down to do you get, and this is pressure filled, this statement, but do you get quarterback right in Nebraska, right? Do you take care of the football? Do you get quarterback right? And a line here from Rittenberg is really good. And let's chat about this. We'll get Mitch's thoughts as well. But how does Rule change Nebraska's late game DNA? And when he had a chance to talk with Rule, Rule's quote, it's on us as a staff setting a standard of the behavior that causes these results, not allowing it. Uh, and we're celebrating people who do it this way. I don't know if that's DNA, but getting into to winning habits. Now, you got to have success. You've got to win some ball games. You've got to win a close ball game to, to have that proof of concept. I already believe this team's buy-in as much as it's emphasized and reiterated with the, the culture and the chemistry that it's going to follow suit or it won't be that hard to, to believe, right? And uh, you got to go do it for sure. And the minute it gets to, uh, to, to, to pucker time, how do you react? But do you, do you instill a, not a false sense of security, but do you instill an uber level of confidence where it truly is next play, good, bad, ugly, next play. And and then you have winning habits. And do you have depth? Do you have playmakers? Do you have ball security? Do you have guys on third and eight to come off the edge and go get the quarterback? Do you have defensive backs that can cover uh, in some tight situations on third and medium? Do you have a run game that 
you can lean on. Is that old line ready to rock and roll and get you uh, 75, 80 yards like the bar was in the fourth quarter? And it comes back to quarterback. You have a quarterback that can take care of the ball, presuming the O-line gives him time. Can the quarterback make the play, make the throw, not make the mistake? And right now, the way things are trending, you've got a, a phenom as a freshman. You've got another uber-talented kid, a home state kid, and you've got a progressing guy that has been developed, he's been coached, and as his offensive coordinator's talking about him, uh, is looking really good. A guy that not only did you win with last year to the tune of five games, but think if he puts it all together where he's an accurate thrower, a confident thrower, on top of his running ability when and if you have to turn to him. I mean, that's uh, that, that's three really nice options for Nebraska, two of which are young, but it doesn't feel like Raiola right now through his spring is playing at a true freshman level. And the, the question to me with these tight, it's not talent. Talent is not to me what is what is the issue in these close games because in order to reach a close game, to be down by three points late, you have to be able to compete physically with the team that's across from you. To me, it's a, the question of, and it's a million dollar question literally with rules salary and with NIL now and the, the amount of dollars going to this program. How do you get your team comfortable in that moment? So it's not tight, it's not mm-hmm. loose, it's that perfect mix of, of confident and looseness. How do you get them confident in that moment that, you know what, it's going to be our result? We'll get to Mitch Sherman from The Athletic next on Hale Varsity. It's that time. Psst. Hey, Mitch. Mitchie, 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 Mitchie. We're looking for you, pal. Mitch Sherman from The Athletic, talking Big Red. Unleash the fury, Mitch. Unleash the fury! On Hale Varsity Radio. Back with you, it's Hale Varsity. We're powered by Cornhead Lager, Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal, back from Denver, Connor Clark. We welcome in Mitch Sherman with The Athletic at Mitch Sherman on Twitter. You can also hear him with the Locked On Nebraska pod. Mitch, it's almost spring football Saturday. How are you doing? It is, yeah, it is. It's like uh, it's like a game day, but not a game day uh, coming up this Saturday. So I'm I'm doing well. Um, glad that it's an eleven o'clock kickoff, so that should free up some of the day. Um, looking forward to seeing sixty thousand or so people at Memorial Stadium and and watching watching whatever we get to see out there at practice, scrimmage, let's, whatever let's, it is. Let's get into that, and I want to start off with what you believe, what, what you believe about the, the quarterback race going into this, this spring game Saturday. I believe that Dylan Rayola has um, begun to show his, his um, talent toward the end of this spring. I think that they've... As Marcus Satterfield discussed today, urged him to play with uh, enthusiasm, and he has started to do that. Um, I think he was fine up until that point, Mm -hmm. but you're starting to see what made him a a five-star talent, Um, or we're not necessarily starting to see that, but the people who are on the field with him uh, who are in the stadium. We may see a bit of it on Saturday, but I think they'll do their best to make it a controlled scrimmage where the opportunities are equal for the top three quarterbacks, and it doesn't appear that one is running away with this thing. Now, you might see a spectacular play, and it could come from any of the three, but this is a small dose of what the coaches get, not just over the spring, but throughout the off season. Um I think that they've all had their moments this spring and that Heinrich Harburg is somebody who struggled last year to throw the football has looked good this spring and that Danny Kalen has adapted well to college football. But what we expected coming into this off season with Dylan Raiola as the, um, again, the five-star kid, um, that kind of, that, that, that reality has begun to become clear within the Nebraska football uh, environment. Well, Mitch, as we look ahead to the spring game Saturday, and it's going to be the fans' real chance to get a look at these quarterbacks, if we're going to put this on a a sliding scale, is the spring game closer to a a show for the fans, or is it closer to a a real practice with real takeaways, real stuff you you can get on film? Because you obviously don't want to show too much to potential 
future opposition, but at the same time, you want to give the fans a taste of your team. You want to give them a, a chance mm-hmm. to give them, I guess, uh, some excitement for the fall. Where on the sliding scale does the spring game rank to you in terms of the takeaways that you can have and I can have and the, the general fan can have? Yeah, if um, if one on your sliding scale is a show and ten is a real um, a real uh, evaluation period for coaches and fans, I put it at like a three. Okay. I think that's that's it's mostly a show. That's my thought. I I don't I don't believe that there's a lot to be taken from this, and that the the the, the priority is to get everybody out healthy and feeling good and moving toward the summer. Um, most of most of what happens in the spring, the vast majority of the uh, the data that the coaches will use to make any kind of decisions that are made now, and a lot of the decisions are going to go into August, but anything that's determined now, um, the vast majority of it comes in, in the first 14 practices. And then this Saturday is, yeah, it's an opportunity to see them react in – in um, in a in a stadium with people, and for some of the players, I think it's important to have that um, you know to have that data point. And maybe you could put the quarterbacks at the top of that list. That's probably the number one thing I would take away from Saturday with the quarterbacks is do they do they play? Um, how do they handle the pressure of being in in the closest thing that they're going to face to a game like environment? before August comes around. As far as just the performance, you know, completion percentage, the, um, the types of throws that we see, there's, there's just so much more to gather, I think, for the coaches from everything else that they see in the offseason versus what they see in 10 or 12 throws on Saturday. Well, Mitch, taking in consideration everything you just said about it being a show, I mean, how physical – can you really even be in this game? And I'm more so talking about the trenches because you want to talk about the D-line, you want to talk about the O-line, how productive are those two units going to be, maybe even the whole front seven for the defense. I mean, what do you expect from kind of that sector of the field? Well, yeah, I think they're going to be physical. I think they're going to get after each other in the trenches. I don't think that the Tony White's defense is going to be sending a bunch of extra uh, pass rushers at the quarterbacks, and, and even if they do, they're 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 not going to be tackling um, Harbor, Graola, and Kalen. Uh, maybe the maybe the some of the other quarterbacks. Um, although I would think they're probably all going to be in green jerseys. I'll, I'll I'll just course correct myself in the midst of of that answer. <laughs> um, but but uh, yeah, I, I I do think that the linemen who are out, you're not going to see Ben Scott most likely or Bryce Benhart. Ty Robinson, Nash Upmaker, um, probably very little of Jamari Butler, but I think the guys who are out there, and it's the younger players. No, the, the, there's there's no doubt the linemen are not going to ease up. It's not a situation where uh, the coaches and and the people who are are writing the writing the script for this thing are or may coming up with the game plan for this thing. They they may be wanting to take it easy and and have it be pretty basic. But the players who are out there are going to play hard, and especially at the line of scrimmage. You know, they there's still spots to earn, and every little thing counts. You know, even though it's probably no more important than another practice, um, they they want these guys to go hard all the time, and you're going to see that for sure on Saturday at the line of scrimmage. It just it, it isn't going to be all of the top line players. Well, in and, and Coach Rylo strikes me as the kind of guy that would expect his guys to be going full speed at all times, even if they aren't even yeah. wearing pads. Like, he, he, that's the kind of coach that he is. Like, oh, you're not in pads, no helmets today? Well, I still expect full speed. That's the kind of coach he is. Uh, yeah, no doubt about it. And I mean and that I've as a compliment. That. I've seen that in, yeah, in practice. I mean, we've been, we've been out there at practices where they're, where they're in half pads or, you know, they're in helmets and, and shorts and, and – and yeah, he's he's on them, and he's he's just as loud and energetic and and demanding as he is, I think, in a in a scrimmage situation like what they went through last Saturday at Memorial Stadium. Mitch, let's talk pass rushers. That was a topic of discussion uh, with Coach White in, in, in his last media session. And do you feel good about the, the progress Nebraska can make? Re, re, being real, and, and your friend uh, Adam Rittenberg 
a uh, good follow up to to his time uh, when he when he caught up with Coach Rule was you know asking about you know Nebraska changing their late game DNA. That's taking care of the football. That's mm-hmm. making some plays on offense. But as great as the defense was last year, they needed to make one more play or get one more stop on third down and eight. It felt like right. I mean that was the the number. Uh, and a lot of that can can be solved by taking the ball away or getting after the quarterback. Do you like the progress yeah. Nebraska's made or can make, do you think, with the bodies, the options uh, getting after the quarterback? Do they have a pass rusher or two? I like what I see on the roster. Um, I mean, I don't see a Randy Gregory. You know, I, I don't see a, a Joey Bosa on the roster. But I think they have they have more than adequate pieces. And I think in in the scheme that – Tony White runs, it's not as essential to have one player who's an all-American type as a pass rusher because they can generate a pass rush in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. They can get it from the linebacker position, you know, from the middle of the field. They can get it from the jack linebacker position. It's encouraging to see what, to hear what, what they say about Chief Borders this spring and that he's a problem out there on the field after really kind of feeling his way, I think, through that first season in Nebraska that he's come to an understanding that he can be the kind of player that's a difference maker for Nebraska. Um, you know, he, we've we've been hearing about Chief because of of the person that he is since the day he got to Nebraska, and we know he's an athlete. He was at Florida, and and, and just been kind of waiting for things to click on the field, and maybe that's happened this spring. So he's someone who can be a big part of the fast rush. You know, Jamari Butler was there last year, um, led Nebraska in sacks, and I think he'll be a bigger piece of it this year. It's so dependent on the, the kind of push they can get or the kind of rush they can get off the edge. It's so dependent on the push that they, that they get in the middle. Even if Hupmaker and Robinson and Riley Van Poppel and that crew in the middle of the defense, there's a lot of young names there too. And, and maybe we'll get a bit of, a, of a, an understanding about who's separating themselves among some of the young names in, in on the defensive line here in, in the work that they get done on Saturday. Not to say that guys are going to win positions on Saturday, but it could be an indication of the way that they've practiced throughout the sprint, just to, just how much they show up the, uh, on the defensive line, especially on the interior. I think we have a good idea of who the players on the, the edge will be. So James Williams was somebody who emerged um, unexpectedly last year as an edge rusher and he's taken steps or seemingly has taken steps to diversify his game. So the, the, the thing that Tony white has going for him with his defense, when it comes to the pass rush is you don't know where it's coming from. It could come from a corner cornerback position. It could come from the nickel spot. Um, it could come from the inside linebacker spot with a young guy like Vincent Shavers. So they have a lot of options. I mean, Javen Wright, I think is such a dynamic athlete that he can, he can rush the passer and get sacks. Um, we've seen Marquise Buford do it at, at, from a safety position. So, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's about having a diverse attack, and um, Tony's very good at, at scheming that up. Mitch, before we get you out of here, we've got about 60 seconds left. I want you to call your shot. Name the guy that whenever you hop on our show next week, we're going to mm-hmm. be talking about. Who's the guy that you think has an impressive spring game on Saturday? Well, I can't, who are you? You could be talking about anybody, Elijah. I, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to say, I'm going to say that that people will be talking about, um, people will be talking about Maurice Mazuka, um, and we've heard some about him through the through the spring. People will be talking about about Jacory Barney. People will be talking about Vincent Shavers. So there's three names for you. A couple of true freshmen, early enrollees. Everyone will talk about Dylan Rayola, but that that's a given. You're talking about guys who are a little bit more under the radar. Maybe those two scholarship guys are not. And we've heard about Mazuka this spring as as the running backs have been a discussion point. He's a, a third down back. You know, those probably somebody who will get a, b- a bunch of carries and an opportunity to impress. So um, I predict um, – I predict Mazuka and not the big guy who plays offensive guard, his older brother. Mm. Mitch, good stuff. We'll see you Saturday. Thank you. Okay, thanks. And now. And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. Big thanks to Mitch Sherman and open phones here till 5. Teddy Bell coming up. Again, the 
Team Jack event uh, panel and uh, opportunity for you to catch up with Kenny, Amir Abdullah, Nate Gary at the Herdat Sports Bar and Grill. Get there Friday at 5.30, the La Vista location and uh, food and drink uh, expenditures uh, go towards the uh, Team Jack folks. That's incredible. Get your reservation now with uh, the Herdat Sports Bar and Grill. We'll talk more spring football with Kenny. Uh, check in with Michael Brunts for Husker Baseball. You want to hear Mitch if you just caught part of it or need to hear it again. Spotify, iTunes, Google Play for the Hale Varsity Radio podcast. Give us a rating. Check out the YouTube channel, Hale Varsity Radio. Twitter as well. We'll have it for you. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal, Connor Clark. And we're talking about that DNA, uh, that, that late game DNA for Nebraska uh, you have folks chiming in on that. Scott says turnovers. Absolutely. Do you have a quarterback that can go make you plays? Do you have a quarterback that can, <laughs> that can take care of the football? And just an offense in general. Let's hear a little bit from Marcus Satterfield today. And Mitch mentioned it while we were talking with him about uh, part of that, that leadership slash field general mentality. And it's um, – it's it's real and guys you know this it's hard to walk in as an, a newbie and just kind of start directing traffic barking orders uh guys most of the time aren't comfortable with that you, you gotta show your worth through doing and the work ethic through the performance and what's your what's your daily work ethic like i mean a lot of that goes a long way especially on fields of play and that's one thing that uh, that Sat was asked about, and uh, he was asked about the, uh, the 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 jump that that Dylan Raiola has made, and uh, when it comes to some of the challenges as well that that he's had to to go through. So let's uh, let's hear from Sat real quick, and uh, the quarterback plan first and foremost before we get to that comment here. Cut one with just what we'll see Saturday with the quarterbacks. The plan is they'll all get chances to play with all the different groups. Uh, you know, they're still battling, playing, uh, you know, battling and competing with each other. And then what I want to see is just them taking care of the football, securing the snap, taking care of the football, throwing the ball away when needed, uh, just making sure that we have the ball at the end of every whistle. And what was what has been Dylan's biggest jump since he got going with spring football to now just a few days removed from the spring game? I think we challenge him to, to play, you know, to get his, not bad body language, but to get his energy going because people are going to feed off him. And he, he played like he was at recess. He played like he was in third grade out on the playground, flying around, moving around, dancing around, giving people high fives. And I think that, that bled, into, bled into our offensive uh, guys, gave them a lot of confidence to go out and do some really good things on, on Saturday, this past Saturday. Key word there, Schmidt, you heard, is that that, that, level of I guess leading by example from Marilla what, what did Satterfield say it gave the offense confidence it gets back to what we opened the show with discussing how does Nebraska change its DNA in late game moments well it comes down to to being able to be confident in yourself and being able to loosen up in those tight moments when you're down by three so you don't think well, what happened the last 15 times it's about what's going to happen this time and having a quarterback in the huddle that you have confidence in not just based on what he says, but what he does, how he plays the football game. Whenever you break that huddle, walk up to the line of scrimmage, knowing, hey, we got a quarterback that that I'm protecting here, I'm running a route for, whatever it may be, that I can trust in, that I have confidence in, that could be all you need to flip the DNA in a late game moment. Guys want to play for a dude like that too. I feel like in order to build that confidence, and again, this is a lot easier said than done, is you got to go do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean – that's something that this team hasn't been able to do, whether that's last year, whether that's under Frost. That's been the biggest downfall because, yeah, you can have all the confidence in the world coming in to play a football game because a lot of Division One athletes do because, rightfully so, they're some of the, ba the best athletes in the country. But if you get down to that late-game situation and you know that you have tried and failed numerous times, that's going to affect you one way or another. Now, to gain confidence in that situation, you have to go do it. You have to have success. You can practice confidence all you want on the practice field. You can gain confidence on the practice field. That's a real thing. I'm not saying that you can't gain confidence over the offseason. 
but it's so hard, nearly impossible, to emulate a game situation where you're down three with 25 seconds left on the road and you need a win. So how do you do that? Well, you have to have success in that moment, ultimately, to get to that mountaintop. And this team is yet to do that, but hopefully they're taking steps, steps in the right direction just based off of an attitude perspective. And as Elijah said, you're getting that from one of your youngest guys on the team. Well, and, and that's part of the, the what, the five-star makeup, right? They're just different. They're just different dudes. They're uber-talented, but you, you hope the mentality goes different in a good way. Mentality goes in a matching pair with that different arm talent or ability to, to deliver and, in those moments. And for the most part, this is not a hard and fast rule because we've seen five stars flame out. We've seen five stars that didn't have the the mentality. When you think of quarterbacks, think the number one guy you think of is Tate Martell. It's not a talent thing. It's a a mentality and a a work ethic. And and that's where I'm going. For the most part with these guys, there's some guys that are just naturally gifted. But a lot of these guys, they kind of work for it. There is that mentality level. To, To reach that level, you have to have a certain mentality. And that's not a hard and fast rule. That's not 10 times out of 10. But what about seven out of 10 times, a guy who's a five star, is a five-star for a reason. It's not just because he was blessed by God with the most perfect athletic build of all time. He's a perfect football player. It helps. There's guys that are definitely <laughs> further along in that regard, but to reach the five-star level, you need something to differentiate yourself between you and the four stars. And a lot of times for these guys, it's that mentality. It's what leads them to another level while they're only 15, 16 years old. Well, you got to rely on your training, too, and you hear that, you hear that from coaches all the time. But these guys taken steps a lot of them together now for a second to spring together with the head coach their position coaches the teammates they've seen you seen it uh, accumulate here and you go back to what the staff's getting you ready for and then presumably putting you in position in those late game moments for you to deliver we talk about talent too but I feel like a lot of the stuff when it comes down to it and trying to win a close game late comes down to the stuff that doesn't require talent it requires energy which does not take talent it requires effort which you can give without regarding talent I feel like it's a lot of the fundamentals that come down to it that you don't necessarily need to like obviously being a division one athletic freak always helps I mean we're radio guys for a reason but when it comes down to it I just feel like it's the components of the game that you don't need to be the most talented guy on the field just do your job correctly, and everything else will take care of itself. I feel like we've seen a lack of that over the last handful of years. Maybe that's just me. It's, well, it's, it's about not only trusting yourself, but trusting the guy next to you. That, sure. That's kind of yeah. what you trying to do too much, trying to put too much on your own shoulders in big moments, making those mental mistakes. It's, it's a lot of cases. It's pressing. Not, not trusting yourself or not trusting the guy next to you, both of which lead to pressing. Trying Dion, to do too much. Yep, Dion's asking, are they wearing green jerseys? I would... Bet all of. Uh, I bet all of Schmitty's money on it. I don't have any money. You, I would. You, I would also do that. You would go <laughs> bet Mama's money. I'll put a stake and a beer on that. That's <laughs> well, I'm mean. not. Be- I'm not taking that bet. <laughs> Dion, I think they're going to be wearing green jerseys, and if you get too close to any of the quarterbacks, you'll see a uh, a member of the Nebraska football team running stairs in the crowd. We'll wind down hour one. It's Hale Varsity. We're powered by Cornhead Lager. And now, and now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. One final time, Hale Varsity this hour. Kenny Bell, 10 minutes away, part of the Team Jack event Friday at the Herdat Sports Bar and Grill in La Vista. Get there, get logged on, get your reservations. Walter from Philly checks in, believing the quarterbacks will be wearing green bubble wrap. He also says, been here about the turnover issue for 20 years. Can't argue with you at all, Walter, but you just got to think that it's got to it's got to turn. It's got to pivot one of these years, don't you think? Thunder, not Collins, asks about Elijah and Plummer's crack. You did not take that with you to Denver, did you? Uh, crack? Plummer's crack. No, no crack from me. from the the uh, the commercial. No, I don't think that's legal in Colorado. I, I heard his not, voice. Not yet. I heard his voice come over the uh, the commercial. I'm like, wait a minute, did I leave his mic on for a second? Hold on. No, he's I just realized. talking to himself in here. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute. Montana Husker checks in. Uh, I mean, the turnovers can't get worse, can they? Right? Huh? 
Uh, we'll take roll call. Hope to see some of you if you're on your way to the spring game Saturday at the Single Bear. We'll be there 8 to 10 pregame show for the weekend edition of Hale Varsity In Radio. In person starting five? Well, it's happened. A lot of these folks in the stream have made their way to, to Lincoln for a, a ball game and have said hi. We love you saying hello. There you go. We'll be there Thursday from 4 to 6 Roadshow. Connor will be chained up in studio uh, for, yes. uh, for the Thursday show. <laughs> 489-1240 or 800-825-5865. Uh, Elijah got to see the game winner between the Nuggets and Lakers. Your pure joy moments in sports. Uh, mine was just blindly fist pumping after the Nebraska Missouri win. Uh, my late grandma, bless her soul, Grandma Shirley, got got smacked a little bit and uh, <laughs> unintentional. The glasses were flying. Elijah was hugging hugging uh, pure strangers yesterday, last night. Connor, I'm sure it revolves around the Cubs World Series that final catch. Yeah, because I mean, it's not a Bears thing. Well, it, the, if the double doing game went the other way, then I'd probably <laughs> that would probably be up there. <laughs> but I was not. I was in my house for for the Cubs World Series with my mom and our dog at the time that we literally got like two months prior. So he probably thought that we were absolute psychopaths. But uh, <laughs> that was that was definitely a night I'll never forget. I, I think I've I've made my top three. I've had some time to think. And I said earlier, I think this that this moment last night was top three, and it's not three, and it's probably not two. I think my top three, which I kind of have one across the teams. I've followed one of each of them. Like Nebraska growing up, it was always that 2011 Ohio State comeback. That was the pure yep. joy moment being in the stands. Like Rex Burkhead's go-ahead touchdown was like 20 yards out, whatever it was. Like that's, Swing pass. That's a pure joy moment. Check down. Joystick. Then I look at the Broncos. And I go to that Tim Tebow, Demarius Thomas overtime against the Steelers moment. It's funny. I think that actually exceeds the Super Bowl. Just really? that, that one singular moment. Because it's that moment of, oh, God, Tim Tebow's dropping back to pass on first and 10. This is going to go horribly. <laughs> and Demarius Thomas goes streaking down the field. I think that might even beat the Super Bowl. So it's not Von Miller terrorizing the entire state of North Carolina? The difference being that Von Miller, like that strip sack, was in the first quarter. That's a great moment. But there's still a lot of game left. It's not but a game he, winner. He dominated that game. He did. Jeff chimes in. His uh, pure joy moment play was tailgating with our friends at Blur. Uh, he got to meet Dwayne Wade, Gabriel Union, and played tippy cup against him. And won. They lost. He won. Well done, Jeff. Well done. But we'll take more of your comments into Hour 2, your pure joy moment of sport. I got to go to the Missouri-Nebraska game, 97. Uh, short second, uh, right in there, is going to be Alex Henry, the 57-yard oh. bomb. Hour 2 with Kenny Bell next. The voice of Husker Nation is on the air. This is Hale Varsity Radio. Insight, opinion, expertise, along with the biggest names talking Nebraska sports. Join in with the show at 402-489-1240 or 1-800-825-5865. Now, here are your hosts, Chris Schmidt and Elijah Herbel. Back with you, it's Hour 2, it's Hale Varsity. We're powered by Cornhead Logger, Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal, Connor Clark. We welcome in a standout Husker, all Big Ten performer. You see him on BTN, and uh, you'll catch him at the Herd at Sports Bar and Grill Friday with Amir Abdullah, Nate Gary, Kenny Bell back with us on the show. Kenny, thanks for a few minutes, man. How we doing? Oh, very, very good. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Well, how good, you doing? I'm good, man. Good to hear your voice again, and excited to, to have you uh, guys uh, being a part of Team Jack and uh, the event to, to raise money for pediatric cancer research. And you know, Kenny, a lot going on this weekend. You know it well, and uh, the the spring game uh, brings so many Nebraskans together. I wanted to, to kind of get your thoughts to start out. You know, we'll talk about the event, uh, 530 in La Vista, coming up in a minute. But how juiced are you, man? How excited are you for this spring and uh, what may unfold here, what you get to see uh, Saturday? Yeah, as, al- as always, um, I try and hold off my excitement until usually this week uh, or the <laughs> week leading up to it. But I'm in full Kool-Aid drinking mo- mode, so... I'm very excited for uh, what Coach Rule and the staff and all the guys have in store. I think they've been working hard. I think 
you know, the news has been a little bit quieter, and mm-hmm. I think that's good. That's good news. You know, they're, they're not in the headlines every every other uh, day with something crazy happening. So I think their heads have been down. They've been working hard, and I'm I'm really excited to see the product that uh, that they put forth this year. Kenny, I'm curious to get the opinion of a guy who spent a lot of his life catching passes. What's your take on on Dylan Ryle? The, the little bits you've seen from him, be, like just being on the other side of it, being a guy who received so many passes in your life. Right. What is your take uh, on Dylan Royola? Yeah, it's one thing with the arm talent. Uh, there's always been a lot of guys that can throw it well, but how he's handling the media attention and all the, you know the spotlight and how he's handling that, I, that's what I'm more impressed with. So I think a kid with that kind of talent, um, that, that'll come on the field eventually, that it always does. How you handle the day-to-day uh, with the media and with all the meetings and everything that he's got going on, how fast he adapts to that lifestyle will say a lot to how fast he can adapt come the fall. Quickly here, you, you said there's a lot of guys that have had a lot of arm talent. Who's the guy in your life that had the most arm talent of anyone you've ever seen or anyone you've ever played with? Uh, James Winston, without a doubt. Hmm. Kenny Bell's with us on Hill Varsity Radio, and I want to go to that wide receiver room here real quick. The the guys who will be sp- probably be spending a lot of time with Dylan Raiola this season, but a name we keep talking about, Jalen Lloyd from last year, had a couple of big-time explosive plays expecting more of that from him. What do you expect to jump from first to second year, and what was your experience from your freshman to sophomore year? I think the biggest difference will be the game will start to slow down for them in that, with, in that room particularly. They're going to come into a role now where they're going to be expected to make plays for a young quarterback. Um, it's not, the ball's not going to be perfect every time, and the read's not going to be perfect every time, and it shouldn't be expected out of that room for it to be like that. So those guys have to be confident in their assignment, right, getting lined up and being in the right place so the young man doesn't have to make those decisions. They can be in those de- or be in those positions for him and then make plays and make him look good. That's what wide receivers with a young, unexperienced quarterback, that's what good wide receivers will be looking to do this season. Kenny Bell's with us here, Hale Varsity Radio, heard at Sports Bar and Grill, where you can see Kenny, Amir Abdullah, Nate Gary, uh, Team Jack event, a panel going on Friday at 5.30 in La Vista. Uh, get your reservations now. Uh, food and drink proceeds go to benefit Team Jack and the foundation. And, Kenny, uh, we were talking to start the show off. Uh, question out there about Nebraska changing their late game DNA. What gave you and your team's confidence in those late game moments? You guys had a lot of close wins during your time at Nebraska. Yeah, I mean, it was the preparation that went into the season that these guys are doing right now, right? We believed that when it came down to it, when it was the third and fourth quarter, we didn't believe that those guys worked as hard as, as, hard as we did at 5 in the morning during, in May and in June. And that's when not only those kind of gritty um, times of the game come down to it, but that's all, or it comes down to uh, Ws and losses. That's where you develop a culture within your program of winning, right? Uh, that this is going to be brutal on all of us, but if we can come together, we'll find a way through it, and that's how you win football games in the fall. Kenny, uh, a thought from you as we turn our attention to, to Friday night. What does this Team Jack mean to you and, and your mates? Oh, man, to Team Jack and the, not only the foundation, but the Hoffman family mean the world to myself, my family, and my teammates um, during my I was very fortunate during my Nebraska tenure to spend that time with Rex and the Hoffman family. Um, and we look forward to any event that we can do every single year, whether it's the gala or it's the golf tournament or um, this week um, with the spring game and the Herd That restaurant. Um, anytime that we can try to give back to the foundation and the families, um, we, we jump at that opportunity because the foundation and those families have – um, provided such special experiences for not only myself, but I mean a, a number of guys that are that are from my era of Huskers. Kenny, we've seen this under Matt Rule as well. Guys getting back out into the community, outreach, uh, trying to get connected with the community. It's a, a thing that you and your teammates did really well under Bo Pelini as well. That that community outreach and getting out there. And I want to get your thoughts. What has outreach and in this the Team Jack Foundation brought to you? How has it changed your life? Yeah, absolutely. I think. Uh, I think that's a reflection of the head man, right? I think we did it so much because Bo understood what Nebraskans meant to the University of Nebraska. Um, 
And I think Coach Rule understands that because when you get out in the community and you realize um, that you're a part of something that's much, much bigger than yourself, it humbles you in a way that makes you more open to being a part of something that is not all about you, you know, if that makes sense. Um, when you get out and you see the kids that you have an influence on and the people that cheer you on, you start to realize, you know, I'm, they're not necessarily cheering me specifically on, they're cheering us on. And when you can, when you start to understand that, that's when it becomes pretty special and that's when you can, you know, develop a, a winning football culture. Kenny, is there a specific moment that you remember that kind of reminded you or, or told you that, hey, this is bigger than just the 11 guys on either side of the ball? Was it, you know, running into that full stadium? Was it Jack running it in for the touchdown during the spring game? What was that moment for you saying, hey, this is a massive deal and it's bigger than just football? I think there's a, a lot of uh, aha moments like that for me. Um, but I think the number one was I took my official visit in 2009. We were playing K-State at home. And uh, I was there with, like, Levante David, and we were all there on an official visit. And I realized just by walking into the stadium as, an, as a recruit how much more Nebraska football meant uh, to not only the people but the organization but everyone. Um, how much more it meant to everyone involved than anywhere I had visited. So that was kind of leaving the campus that night. I knew I wanted to go to Nebraska. Kenny, uh, it is NFL Draft Week. You let in with Levante and a great article at ESPN from Jason Light about he is the prototype, man. Anyone you draft, you hope it's Levante David, not only from a talent standpoint but a character standpoint. And Levante still going strong. <laughs> a decade plus in where were you at for the draft I, I know you spent some time in the league and a number of your, your teammates got to the league and uh, right now Nebraska's trying to get back to those numbers getting back into the NFL when it comes to, to this weekend and how was your uh, your NFL draft experience were you with family with buddies how'd it go yeah it went well I was drafted in the fifth round um down to Tampa Bay, I was just at back home in Boulder with family and friends. It was a it was a fun day, um, but a lot of people don't realize the celebration is fun. But I mean, you fly out the next day and you go straight to work, so it's not like you get to <laughs> you don't uh, spend a week hanging out and celebrating. You uh, you celebrate, you watch, and then you pack your bags and you get on a plane and you go to work. So uh, draft experience was incredible, um, but I uh, I can't lie when I say I don't miss uh, the days of NFL training camp. Those those. I'm glad those are behind me. <laughs> yeah, the the word is from pros we've talked to you. You earn your money during camp, and is it as brutal as advertised? I would say more so. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Jesus. The, <laughs> training camp in the NFL is uh, like not very many people experience that kind of environment or culture. Um, it's it's very competitive, and I mean, it's you can get fired every single day that you go to work, so you got to show up ready. Can you replicate an experience like that in college? We've heard about Matt Rule's physical practices and, and, and how Matt Rule likes to to create tough players through tough practices, if you will. Can you even replicate the the pressure and the, the physicality of an NFL training camp in college, or is that just impossible? If I'm being honest, I can't speak on that right now because I don't have the experience with the – you know, I haven't been around a college – practice in the day to day for ten years now. Yeah. I could tell you that when I was in school no one was making hundreds of thousands of dollars. So uh there was definitely uh <laughs> a bit more incentive to making it, if that made sense. Mm-hmm. On top of that, uh I, we had a coaching staff that made sure we were prepared for the NFL by coaching us like we were in the NFL. And I don't know if that exists now in college football just because kids can enter the transfer portal right if you don't like a situation you can leave um that's not that's not like that in the nfl either so the the college coaches man are fighting an incredibly tough battle right now um not that i feel bad for them uh, it's, it's it comes with the territory but they're uh that's a tough that's a tough fight right now so it's so different and the kids or not i want to call them kids the players are at such different levels that I'm not sure you can replicate that at this point in time in college football. Well, when it comes to being prepared for the NFL through college, and we talked to former Husker Jay Moore yesterday, and he said that when he got to Nebraska, he was not an NFL player, but when he left, he was. So when it comes to that coaching staff developing you, not only physically but mentally to be an NFL player, 
Is that just based off of style? Is that based off of attitude, how they treat you? What goes into that? I think it's a combination of all the things. It's all encompassing, right? Um, you have to realize that you, you, you are a student, one, but you're, you are a professional football, or f- football player. That's, that's your job. That's your commitment. And realize, the sooner you realize that, uh, the better. But, I, again, I, it's, it's going to be very difficult um, with the changing times in, in college football to kind of hammer that home. I'm interested to see how it plays out um, in the NFL. It, it, it's gonna, I'm, I'm very interested. It's going to make it an interesting case study, to say the least. Kenny Bell's with us here on Hale Varsity Radio. He is at the Herdat Sports Bar and Grill Friday, 5.30 in La Vista. Nate Gary, Amir Abdullah, the Team Jack event. Uh, get your reservations with Herdat Sports. And uh, proceeds go to uh, Team Jack. And uh, Kenny and, and his mates uh, are so gracious to to be a part of it and uh, going to be up there in La Vista at the Herd at Sports Bar and Grill. So get your reservations now. Kenny, we were talking pure joy moments in sports. Elijah was at the Denver Lakers game last night, saw the game winner. Oh. We have uh, a lot of folks and friends in the stream as uh, they are saying some of their pure joy moments were seeing your return against Penn State. Uh, that 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 that, uh, that overtime snow globe ball game. How about the block I against well, Wisconsin? I was going there too. The the time you, you murdered somebody uh, in in <laughs> Indy. Uh, those are a couple that that have been brought up. Husker fans chiming in. What's your pure joy moment, either as a player or as a sports fan? I'll I'll give you a couple here because uh, you, you guys just took me right down memory lane. Um, number one, obviously, is uh, Jack's run. Yeah. Um, as a fan and as a player, that was the most unique and special moment I ever experienced in my career, and I'm forever grateful um, to the, the Nebraska staff, um, administration, players, and the, obviously the Hoffman family, and then obviously all of the Nebraska fans that cheered that on. That was incredible. We uh, Jack won an S before it, and everything that has ensued from that, um, I could not be more grateful for. So that's probably obviously number one. Shout out to everyone that said the Penn State kickoff because that personally for me is my favorite play in my Husker career. Uh, that was a big one, and I was young, and that kind of um, shook the cobwebs of being young and inexperienced um, on the team and moved me into more of a, a veteran role, and I was very, very, very happy about that one. Um, as a fan, um, by far the best moment is uh, the Nuggets winning the championship last year, obviously. And then the year before that, uh, the Avalanche winning, mm-hmm. um, flying down to Tampa Bay and watching the Avs hoist the cup in the city that I was drafted by was awesome. Um, <laughs> it, literally living in the glory days of Colorado sports right now, and I am loving every minute of it and very, very thankful for it. Tell you what, Kenny, you should have been there for that game winner last night. That was something. I know, I know. I wish you wouldn't have. I wish you. <laughs> I wish you wouldn't have said that. That was a dagger. I posted it on my Instagram. With Jamal shooting over AD this morning. Um, yeah, I'll, if if there's a game five, I'll definitely be there on Monday. You get a chance to draft uh, one former or or uh, or former teammate or former Husker for the upcoming Team Jack golf outing this summer. Before we say goodbye, who is it? Ooh. Everyone actually tag him because I'm trying to get him to come to the tournament. So if you guys could tag Eric Crouch for me, get after him, let him know we want him at the Team Jack Golf Tournament. We'd love to have him out. And I need some revenge because he beat me up all over uh, Benson Golf Course last time we played. <laughs> um, he took me out there and whooped me all over the course. So I need, a, I need some rematch. I need a rematch, and we need to get him out for the foundation and for some golf this summer. So Kenny's saying payback. I mean, uh, come on out uh, for for a friendly for round a good of golf. Cause. For a great cause. Yeah, Amazing yeah, cause. Exactly. Get out to uh, La Vista Friday night, 530, Heard at Sports Bar and Grill. Team Jack event with Kenny Bell uh, with us here on Hale Varsity. Amir Abdullah, Nate Gary, 530 start time. Get your reservations. Proceeds go to Team Jack. Kenny, you take care. Uh, we'll see you Saturday. Thanks for the time. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me, guys. Go Big Red. And now. And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. Back into it. It's Hale Varsity, powered by Cornhead Lager. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal, Michael Brunts with us from Husker 24-7 at Michael Brunts on Twitter. 
as he is the proud owner of a unicorn swimming pool, not a Denver fan when it comes to the throwback unis. And uh, Bronx, is, is anybody a throw or fan of the new Broncos uniforms? That was the question. I the, thought the throwbacks the, are better than nothing. I but. like the white, the white look with the old Denver D. So, Bronzy, you you don't like the old orange crush unis? No, I love them. The that that needs to be the uniforms, not the uh, the XFL USFL versions they've been running out the, the last couple of days here. They it, they look it looks way too much like. Texas, San Antonio, or like UTEP. No offense. <laughs> I will say, Brunson, I was in Denver yesterday. I rolled down to the stadium. I was one of the first people there. I was just going to go uh, check out the stadium and see if there was any like mannequins, and I was one of the first people to the fan store. So I, I have sent you a picture here live during the interview of the pictures I took of the mannequins. They look better in person. I still don't think they're an upgrade on the old uniforms, but upon seeing them like up close, personal, like I was... I was like, okay, you know what? They're maybe not as bad as I thought whenever I saw them on Twitter. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll take your word for it. The, <laughs> the, I, I don't know why they need to make this difficult. I mean, you basically, you had the perfect uniform, perfect logo back in like 1989. Like it, the, the perfect logo has been there for years. Just use that logo. That's all you got to do. And they keep screwing it up. And then somehow it got even worse because they traded for Zach Wilson yesterday right after they announced the jerseys. I don't know which, which thing they're trying to cover up, the, the terrible trade or the terrible uniform. You tell me. Uh, both is the answer. Yeah. Both is the answer. But at least, you know, Peyton's going to trade up and get you that long-lost Elway 2.0, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, they, they, at least, like, I, my theory initially was they were trying to save themselves a buck by not having to switch the last names on the jersey, but... They, uh, I guess they have to now with the Wilson. So, uh, Bronte, spring football Saturday, a uh, lot of anticipation. Some things you're excited about here uh, with the great of salt, it being the spring game. Yeah, no, it, um, you know, quarterbacks, I think, are kind of towards the top of the list. I, I think you're going to see a lot of veterans who are not going to be playing or suited up on Saturday. I'm expecting some pretty vanilla play calls as well not to throw any water on that for anybody that's on the fence about going. But um, I, I, I do think, you know, the, the quarterbacks are going to be the headline uh, for better, or for worse. Uh, by the time you, they walk off the field on Saturday, um, you know, I, I, you're also kind of eager to see some of the young guys that, that, you know, we've been hearing a little bit about. I mean, it, it feels like almost every other, you know, media availability, you get a Vincent Shavers mention, kind of curious to see how he looks at that inside linebacker spot. And and just kind of seeing, you know, the, the, this wide receiver group too. I mean, I, I think there's going to be a lot of attention focused on the offense and for good reason. And uh, who knows? I mean, if you, you – maybe you, you get a deep ball, maybe, maybe a couple deep balls hit to a new guy. I mean, you might be uh, talking about things like we did in 2011 when Breon Carnes hit Jamal Turner long. Uh, in the spring game. So uh, maybe, maybe get a little bit of buzz from that. It's Michael Bruns with us here on Hale Varsity Radio, uh, talking some Husker spring game thoughts. And, and Bruncey, what's your take on, I guess, optimism with the offense following what sounds like another good scrimmage on Saturday? Do you think there needs to be a, a regression to mean by the time Saturday rolls around? You know, offense trying to keep a little bit under wraps, the defense has a little motivation after a couple of bad scrimmages. Do you expect a return to means, uh, return to the mean, I should say, in that regard on Saturday that the defense might come back and, and, and play well? Yeah, and it's it's always it's kind of interesting because you never really know how guys are going to react when the lights are on, right? You know, for it, it's one thing to kind of do it as a quarterback or a skill position player when it's a scrimmage and there's not a ton of people in the crowd. And it's a totally different thing when you're having to do it in front of a crowd of, you know, 50,000 or more for the first time. Like it, it, it's a completely different animal. So I'm expecting a little bit of regression in that way. Uh, I like, I, I don't think they're going to run more or anything more exotic on offense on Saturday than what they've run in the, uh, the, the, the two scrimmages. So I, I don't know. I mean, I think as long as I think if the offense is efficient and, and you don't have, you know, the false starts and the turnover issues and things like that. I mean, I, I think you can kind of take that as a nice little bow on what I think has been a pretty strong spring for the most part for the offense. I mean, I, I think 
you know, they've, they've got some pieces in place where they can get some things done and, and be improved from last year. And, um, you know, like I said, I mean, I, I I'm expecting you're probably not going to have a lot of the veteran defensive guys in there. So, uh, you know, you, you got to take that big, uh, grain of salt there as well. But I mean, I, I'm expecting, you know, the offense, uh, to be competitive. We'll see how explosive they can really be though. Michael Brunt's with us here on Hale Varsity Radio, senior writer with Nebraska 24-7. can find uh, Bruncey uh, on Twitter as well, at Michael Brunt's spring football thoughts for Saturday. Do you expect a noticeable or a big gap, or do you think it will be a situation where all three quarterbacks look good? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I, I'm guessing that it'll probably vary based upon who's with whom on, on the offense. I mean, I, I think that's going to be – the big thing is, you know, how each of those quarterbacks looks with, you know, what you would kind of say is the top offense or pieces of the top offense. Um, you know, I, I think each quarterback's kind of had their, their, their moment at times this spring. And, you know, I, I, I think, you know, the, the, this is going to carry on, this competition is going to carry on into the fall. So I'm not expecting too huge of a gap, but I mean, I think in, in certain things that the quarterbacks are going to be asked to do, I'm expecting that things will look a little different. I mean, I, you know, Dylan Raiola has a really strong arm and I, I think that's going to show up. Um, it's just going to look a little bit different coming out of his hand uh, than it does the other quarterbacks. So, uh, you know, we'll see what kind of results that, that, you know, brings along, but you know, I, I, I think, uh, I think they're going to rotate a fair amount with those quarterbacks. I mean, I, I really think they're going to give each of them a chance to kind of work with that top offense and see what they can do. So we'll see how that looks. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think as much as anything for the, the for Kalen and Riola, it's about just kind of managing the moment because this, this is, you know, on a, a totally different level than anything they've experienced before. Michael, when you look back to, to last season, the spring game into to fall, I think there was some tinkering with the offense. I want to get your thoughts, though. Do you think that Marcus Satterfield tailored his offense to his quarterbacks, as you're, you're kind of saying here, that with different strengths, they do different things? Do you think we saw that last year with the offense, that the offense was tailored to the quarterback, depending on who was in there? Yeah, I mean, I you know, the, the offense that Heinrich Harburg was running in the middle of the season was not the offense that, they went into the season looking to run. Um, you know, there was going to be a lot of the quarterback run stuff with Jeff Sims, but I think they kind of found that, you know, there were there were different strengths that Harburg had that, you know, Sims didn't necessarily have. I mean, I, I think Heinrich Harburg had a pretty good feel for some of the option stuff and, and, and better so than the other quarterbacks, and, and that's kind of what they went with when he was healthy. So I, I think there's kind of a – there's, there's kind of a base offense that they they want every to, everybody to be able to do that kind of pro style offense um, that that they want to run and they're going to run come hell or high water. But I think kind of the wrinkles that they run off of that are probably a little bit different based on who's in there and, and kind of what those strengths are. And I would expect that that would be you know the, the case um, this year too. I mean, uh, you know, if you go to Harburg, I mean, it, it's going to look a little bit different probably in what they call. Um, compared to the other two who aren't necessarily uh, as good of runners or as willing of runners as maybe what Heinrich is. So I, I think it, I think you kind of always have to ta- tailor it a little bit. I think last year was a little bit of a special case given kind of how things played out where it was, uh, you know, a different offense in the middle of the season. And then once you had even more injuries, it was just kind of a, a, a potpourri almost of kind of what they were trying to do. And, and that's, that's a tough way to have success. Bronson, we'll get you out of here on this. Want to get your thoughts on tonight, Nebraska, Kansas, Drew Christo, Big Red trying to, to fix Tuesdays. Yeah, no, another another uh, swing at midweeks for Nebraska. Uh, pun like in, pun intended there? Was there a pun intended there? <laughs> kind of, a little bit. <laughs> um, it, uh, you know, with Christo, uh, he's been in the, in the weekend all over. Um, they went to Will Walsh on Sunday instead of Drew Christo, and now he gets Tuesday night. It's an opportunity for him to kind of step in and, um, you know, kind of get right the ship a little bit. His, his last couple outings have not been uh, very good. He hasn't made it out of the third inning in either of those starts. So this is a chance for him to kind of reset the deck a little bit on kind of where his season's headed. And, you know, for Nebraska, you know, they, they came off of a, a, a nice series win over Maryland. They won with the mercy rule on Sunday. 
Um, this, this Kansas team is actually playing pretty good baseball too uh, themselves. They they went down to Baylor and, and uh, won a series down there. They won by mercy rule on Sunday too. So uh, th- this should actually be a pretty good matchup. Potential for a high scoring game just based on how uh, the, the the pitching kind of lines up and also how the offenses uh, tend to play. So. Um, you know, opportunity for Nebraska to kind of get get more things done on this homestand. They've got uh, th- this midweek, and then they host Iowa for three coming in here. So it's a really important week for Nebraska in terms of kind of where they're headed. Michael, quickly here, I'm not sure. I've been out of town on vacation, so I'm not sure I'm out of the loop here, but I'm seeing that tonight is Canadian night at Haymarket Park for this Husband Denim. Game. Does anyone know what that means? Is that just wear your, your best Canadian tuxedo? What does that entail? Do you have any idea? Uh, I believe, well, now that you can get, get beer, maybe that means that you're looking at a Labatt's or a Molson's or something like that. But um, I, I think that means you, you a strong chance of poutine, maybe. <laughs> they, they, get, they get you like the, the, the souvenir cup of poutine. Um, I, I don't know. It's just a, uh, a celebration of the fact that Nebraska has more Canadians on their roster than you'd probably expect uh, by just looking at it. But, uh, yeah, I, I guess, you know, put, put the jeans on. Um, get, get get the gravy and uh, head out to the ballpark. I guess that's the recipe there. Jean jackets, uh, smoked meat, and Labatt's. Yeah, uh, yep. uh, and, the, yell, the, and yelling about the maple leaves. That's what you're doing tonight. Go Leafs! Bruncey will uh, check in later. Thanks for the time. Anytime, guys. Thanks a lot. Good to spend time with Michael Brunt, Hale Varsity Radio. Dave Manerick going to join us here next segment. We'll talk Cornhusker State games. Time to get signed up and get that wiffle ball team assembled. Reminder about Nebraska Department of Highway Safety. Uh, use your seat belt. It saves lives. It prevents injuries only if properly worn. Make it click. A message from the NDOT Highway Safety Office. We forgot to ask Bruncey about his pure joy moment in sport. Uh, Elijah lived it, per se, last night. Denver and Lakers playoff game winner. Laid out my Nebraska memories. Kenny Bell talked about a couple of his moments in top one, of course, with Jack's run. I'm going to throw the court storm against Wisconsin in there for me, Oh, that's, too. that's fair. That's very good. Hell of a comeback. Uh, some memories to be made for sure with Cornhusker State Games. We'll tell you about it. Dave Manerick, executive director, next. And now, and now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. Back with you, it's Hale Varsity. We're powered by Cornhead Lager. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal, Cotter Clark. Todd emails in, hands down to this day, even as a young 22-year-old, seeing Tom win his first natty and the emotion in his eyes the best. That was Todd chiming in on his pure joy moment in sports. A lot of joy with Cornhusker State Games, the Nebraska Sports Council, and they've been doing it for... 40 years celebrating Cornhusker State Games. Dave Manerick with us, executive director, of course, across the Hale Varsity Radio Network, and also watch this on the stream, Hale Varsity YouTube. Dave, I love the uh, the backdrop, my friend. It's good to talk some Cornhusker State Games, 40 and counting, my friend. How are you? I'm doing great. It's hard to believe it's 40 years. I mean, 1985 to me, of course, I'm a relic, doesn't seem like that long ago. You know, I was in high school and I do remember having uh, NET on at my grandma's house. I don't know why we were out there, but on, on a Friday night at some point in the summer of 1985, I had it on and there was the Cornhusker State Games opening ceremonies. And that was my first exposure to the state games. And it was the inaugural year. And a few years after that, I interviewed for the low paying internship of coordinating the statewide torch run. And within a few weeks of being part of the organization, I fell in love with the whole thing. It's sports and a lot of different sports. I, I love geeking out on, you know, what is fencing? I've never seen that before or cornhole or disc golf or, you know, grew up with football, basketball and baseball, but I'm a competition guy. So, mm-hmm. I loved that that whole concept. I love seeing our state from one end to the other and meeting all of these tremendous people in all of these towns, a lot of them that are still great friends today. And uh, by the end of the torch run, the first torch run that I was on in 91, I was hooked. 
And I think that whole spirit, that vibe, that family friendliness, that friendly competition thing, yet very competitive thing <laughs> that all Nebraskans kind of share, that's what makes the Cornhusker State Games great. We have more than 70 sports. It's July. This year it's July 11th through the 21st. So we got competitions on those two main weekends in July. And it's just fun to be part of, to go participate in your favorite thing or to watch. Uh, it's a, it's really a, a spectacle for Nebraska. Dave, before we dive too deeply into this year's games and some of the new sports that are going to be on display this summer, you being a sports guy, you got to have that moment that stands out in your memory of being the, the pure joy moment of sports fandom where whether you're at the game or you're watching it on TV, there is just pure joy based on what happened in, in said sporting event. Do you have that event off the top of your head where it's just pure joy whenever you think back about it? It was definitely the first 90s national championship game when Corey Schlesinger crossed the plane of the goal line. And we were actually, my wife and I were actually driving back from family stuff and we're listening to Kent Pavelka call that game on the radio. And some of my favorite memories, I'm old enough, uh, are, are listening to games on the radio. And I'm a St. Louis Cardinals fan because in Clearwater, Nebraska, you could actually get KMOX. That's and Jack awesome. Buck on the late, <laughs> late at night, believe it or not. Uh, they had the blow torch and we could pick it up. And so I listened to the St. Louis Cardinals. But listening to Kent call uh, call that game was and, – and having been through, you know, in my lifetime, uh, a lot of the 80s just – I mean, super great Husker teams and lots of wins, but just disappointment in all the big moments uh, – so that was my my greatest memory of of fandom, I guess. Dave, I am psyched about the wiffle ball edition that Schmidt was telling me about earlier. In addition to that, what other new things can we expect this year from the Nebraska State games, and how can people get involved? I'm psyched about wiffle ball too. By the way, um, my my kids probably like Schmidt's, and and they. They would go to their club baseball tournament and they would play seven <laughs> games in two days and they could not wait to get home when there was enough daylight and sometimes into the dark to play the neighborhood kids, play with the neighborhood kids in a, in a game of wiffle ball. And so you, you kind of baseball junkies, you get the, the whole thing about wiffle ball. It's the coolest thing ever. You can throw big curve balls. You can fool people with change-ups that – it doesn't quite happen with the baseball that way. No, it didn't. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> I think <laughs> dies midair. <laughs> yes, yes. It's I don't, now they have the blitz balls and everything. You don't need that. You just need a little spin. Dave, tell us. Uh, uh, go anyway, ahead. so well, I was just going to say, you know, it being the 40th year, we're really creating this reunion atmosphere, and we've done that on on past milestone years. You know, I remember 25, we had. We, we did our best to invite everybody back for this year, and that's what we're doing this year. We've, we've invited all of our past torchlighters back to be part of opening night, which happens on uh, July 11th at Pinnacle Bank Arena. Um, and it's just a, it's going to be a fun experience having the torch lighting that night. And, and many uh, past torchlighters who are sports celebrities, we've heard a couple of them mentioned already, uh, here in your show tonight, I was just listening. Jack Hoffman was one of our past torch lighters, as was Eric Crouch. And uh, you know, I didn't even listen that long, and I heard a couple names of prominent Nebraskans who've lit the torch. And so just having that reunion feel is the main thing that we're doing to celebrate 40 years. Dave and Eric's with us. Cornusker State Games get signed up. Uh, entry fees increase after midnight tonight. Uh, you have a sport you love. It's probably in the Cornhusker State Games, Nebraska Sports Council. Schmitty, we got to get you into skydiving this year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Here, take this parachute, says <laughs> says Elijah. I packed it myself. <laughs> <laughs> you did. Bricks. Uh, Dave, let's talk about uh, the, the Alex, if we can. Yeah. Uh, Rebecca and Josiah Alec have agreed to be this year's torchlighters. And... You know, some years back, we used to keep that a mystery every year, but it's just more fun to have people kind of know what, what's going to happen, especially when it's uh, fan favorites like 
the Alex siblings. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, uh, with sports stories, especially Husker stories, which are the the main stories here in Nebraska, uh, these two and the spirit and fire they brought to their teams and each other's teams. One of my favorite things about them was watching them attend each other's games and the other sports that were happening. It's like, these kids are super sports nuts and they, they care for each other. And I love hearing about how they used to just fight. Uh, I mean, physically just throw down. <laughs> and and uh, I have that same relationship with, with my siblings. But seeing, seeing these two and the, and the spirit that they brought to their teams and the spark they gave Nebraska, I think makes them the ideal choice for this year's Torchlighters. Dave, we're up against a hard break. Can we keep you on the other side here? Oh, absolutely. All right. Hang tight. Dave Menarek with us, Nebraska. Uh, and uh, you love it. The Cornusker State Games Year 40 deadline uh, before prices increase tonight at midnight, CornhuskerStateGames.com. And Dave, during this break, we need you to think of some pitches to convince Schmitty to join the skydiving competition. I, I think yes. that could be a lot I, of fun. I will do the, I, I will not, I'm not a heights guy, but I am a wiffle ball guy. So <laughs> hang tight, more with Dave Manerick. And uh, get the podcast segment, uh, Spotify, iTunes, Google Play with Hale Varsity Radio. We'll wind down to Tuesday next. And now, and now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. One final time on a Tuesday, it's Hale Varsity powered by Cornhead Lager, Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal, Cotter Clark. Big thanks to Mitch Sherman from The Athletic, Keddy Bell uh, in Hour 2, Michael Brunts of Husker 24-7, Dave Manerick still with us and excited to talk Cornhusker State games with him as it's uh, the 40th anniversary of Cornhusker State Games. Dave, so many sports, so many different venues to, uh, to, to celebrate the Cornhusker State Games. We talk all the games in, in several locations around the state, and that thing's continued to grow. you got to be proud. Yeah, I love it. The, the most sports are still held in Lincoln, but we have 11 sports that take place in Omaha now, or greater Omaha. We have different sports that happen in Fremont, Columbus, Grand Island, and North Platte. And we've pulled a couple of our traditionally uh, good sports sort of out into their, into their own events in Kearney. So we, we have a presence in a lot of the communities in Nebraska, and that makes me really proud. Are you participating or are you just observing? I'm signed up for the 5K run. Oh, cool. And I... I sign up every year and it works out about half the time that I, I uh, get down there and get the sneakers on and, and, uh, and go ahead and actually give it a go. But I always sign up just so uh, as I'm out visiting sites, if I, you know, if it feels right and I, I can do it, I'll just, I'll just jog the event. I'm not, a, I'm not a, a running for time. I'll put it that way. <laughs> Dave, uh, one more time. How can folks get signed up? How can they get locked in and, uh, they need to do it before midnight for uh, before that price increase. Yeah, it's actually midnight tomorrow night. So thank you. Uh, yes. They got an extra day, so Wednesday night, uh, all day all day Wednesday you have. Uh, but sign up tonight anyway. It's cornhuskerstategames.com. Click on the sport listing, and you'll be able to find all the details, the date you have to play, and you'll avoid a price increase again if you get in before tomorrow night at eleven fifty nine. Real quick, uh, some of the partners that have helped uh, you out uh, and continue to be uh, friends of the Cornhusker State Games. Yeah, you know, our platinum partners, you know, have all been around for quite a while, but we have over 150 sponsors, and that's $1,500 and up. Uh, we, don't, we don't really receive any government or tax funding. We've always been an organization that partners with the business community, and the business community in Nebraska is so awesome. They really support things like this and enable us to do what we do and have a year-round presence and be one of the best organiz- be, be the best organization that does state games across the country. Our team is amazing, and uh, the other uh, states pretty much line up to, to understand and know what we're trying to do in Nebraska and follow us around. It's, it's pretty cool. Dave, thanks so much for your work and what you've done, and being a part of Cornhusker State Games, you and your team, and Nebraska Sports Council Executive Director Dave Manerick, 
and uh, get signed up uh, for Cornhusker State games. We will huddle men on the the wiffle ball. I got an idea, though. If we can't get the wiffle ball going, we could get a KFOR sports golf scramble. Done. Golf. That sounds good. We can show up and get our asses kicked by Jay Moore. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not if he's on the team. <laughs> <laughs> It's one way to eliminate competition. <laughs> you can't beat them, join them. Yeah. Jay, uh, what are you doing? Uh, Dave, you take care, man. Thanks for, for telling us what's going on. Hey, thanks for always getting us on. We appreciate getting the word out. All right, there he is, Dave Manerick with us. And uh, we'll be back at you tomorrow getting geared up for the spring game. We're at the Single Barrel Thursday Road Show 4-6, to six, weekend edition, pregame before spring game, 8-10 to 10 Saturday. Talk to you tomorrow at 4 with Hale Varsity.